Welcome to this special episode of Safe Home Podcast for struggling teens and their families finding their healing path. I am Beth Syverson, a mom of a 17-year-old son, Joey, who has been dealing with drug addiction, depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation for several years. I'm walking beside him as he struggles with his recovery while I work on my own personal growth and healing. Please note that this episode might contain some swear words, descriptions of drug use, and mentions of suicide attempts, and may not be appropriate for sensitive listeners or younger children. And we want to make sure everyone knows that this podcast is not glorifying or endorsing illegal activity or substance use. This podcast is for educational and harm reduction purposes. And speaking of harm reduction, our very special guest today is Emma Roberts from the National Harm Reduction Coalition. She's the Senior Director of National Capacity Building. Thank you for being here and welcome, Emma. Thank you, Beth. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, my pleasure. Uh, Today's episode, we're going to primarily focus on opiates and your role in harm reduction with the opiates epidemic. Uh, uh, Luckily, uh, Joey has not used opiates, so um, I don't really have any personal experience with it, and I'm grateful to have somebody that knows a lot about the subject to help us all. So I wonder if first you could just tell us how you got into harm reduction, how you've heard about it in the first place, why you made a career out of it, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I, I first got involved in harm reduction. I, I'm from the United Kingdom, I'm from the north of England. I was born in Manchester, and I moved east to Leeds, for folks that might know the geography of the world. Um, and I would say in the mid-90s, I was working for a community centre doing community development work, running like all kinds of different groups for young people, for young moms, you know. Um, and so I was working for this great community development organisation and we saw an uptick in heroin in the mid-90s, a, a heroin availability in the UK. Um, and I was working at that time at a community centre with some really smart people who were like, you know, and, and they were talking to the people at the uh, National Health Service at the time in the UK about ways to address, um, you know, this increase in heroin use. And what we were seeing in the communities we were uh, providing services to were that, that people started to move into using more heroin and then into injecting drug use and move from smoking to injecting it. So there was this range of new needs that people needed addressed. And and people were becoming, because of the stigma around substance use, particularly around opioids and opioids and things like heroin, and, you know, because it's illegal, right? It's an illegal Mm -hmm. act. We're being pushed further to the margins and we're becoming disconnected from services. So this really smart group of people that I worked with at the time were like, you know what? You know, they were talking to the health service, national health service, and they were like, maybe we could set up a syringe service program in in our community. And the national health service was like, yeah, we'll support you. So we like set up this room in the corner of the community center. Um, and at the time, you know, um, I'd been around different drugs, you know, throughout my time growing up. Um, I'd had minimal contact with opioids, but um the one thing, and I, so I was going through this process of like, oh, is this the right thing? I'm, if I get involved, am I enabling people to use drugs, right? Mm-hmm. But what I saw very quickly was, no, that's not what I'm enabling people here. I'm enabling people to be connected, right? To be brought in for services. Because what we saw is when we opened, like, you know, and people were coming in to get services, right? They were coming into the community center and then they were they were rebuilding connections or building new connections to get help you know, all kinds of things. Um, so that, you know, that was that was a way to re-engage people. Um, so it felt really right from the beginning when I first learned about it and I saw it. And then, you know, as, as community center workers, we were trained up to do it. Um, I went off, so that was the mid-90s. I learned about harm reduction. I learned about the philosophy of it. I went off, I worked in other places, but I carried that information with me. Uh, until I came back directly to work in the field in, two, in the mid 2000s, again we saw an uptick in use in in the UK um, and availability of opioids at that time. So I came back to work in it in the mid 2000s. Um, you know, but I think the ethos of harm reduction and that that notion of building connection and engaging people from a place of non judgment and a place of respect and not stigmatizing, and that that's far more kind of healthier and productive and constructive in terms of how we um, 
approach engaging people around their substance use versus shaming them and judging them and telling them them you know all these things about themselves right that you know in the same way that you talk about how you walk alongside Joey right in his journey that's what harm reduction is is I'm walking alongside someone and I'm collaborating with them on on what they feel their needs are right and what their recovery could look like and in harm reduction we talk about it being managed use safer use and abstinence we're not lots of people think oh you're with the opposite of absence we're not we absence is a really big part of our spectrum of how we work with people if that's what they want but if people don't want that or they're not quite ready for it then we can work with them um, across the spectrum around safer and managed use until they're ready to make a different choice or for some people, they get to a point of managing their use and that's they're safe. They can be safe in that in that management, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think the particular like emphasis on opioids and urgency is because of over you know the risks around overdosing, right? And so we've seen, particularly in the US, like this really big increase since around the mid to late 2000s of like the overdose rates going up. So there's been a real emphasis on how we can use harm reduction um, services uh, in relation to opioids, including syringe service programming, right, where we're giving people sterile equipment to use. Um, uh, but um, there's, there's so much research out there that shows that that's a really effective approach. But I know it's still really controversial for some people. It feels like it kind of goes against the grain of common sense that they've been taught around, like, how to keep someone safe, right? yeah. We grew up, you know, just say no, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think people at the time were doing that, obviously from the best of intentions, yep. but we know that that didn't work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and so like, you know, this, this approach, harm reduction that started in Europe in, you know, many decades ago, it's not a new approach. And it came to the US in like the 80s and 90s when people from the US went and, you know, there were pioneers that went over to the, to Europe and saw this mm. approach and brought it back to the US. At the time, it was particularly during the AIDS epidemic when people who used, people who used drugs worked out what was going on for them, right? It wasn't public health folks that were like, oh, it's because you're sharing syringes that you're getting HIV. Mm. People used drugs that worked out the science of this. And it was them that then said, okay, well, we need sterile equipment, <laughs> you know? Mm. In, it, the history of this work comes from people who use drugs. So it's for people who use drugs, by people who use drugs. And that's something that we also, you know, in, when we talk about harm reduction, we really want to uplift that history, right? It's not something that public health was on board with. And in some places still isn't yet, you know, but it's expanded a lot. You know, there's a lot more, it's been researched. The CDC have researched it. Like there's federal agencies, SAMHSA have researched it that, say yes, harm reduction and syringe service programs are very effective in addressing the overall drug use, ha- drug user health needs of people who use drugs. It's not just, yes, primarily it was about preventing HIV um, and hepatitis C transmission, but in terms of engaging people, like I said, that connection piece I talked about at the beginning, it's the really important interventions. Yeah, I understand that the opposite of addiction is connection. Is that yeah. your, what you believe too? Yeah, there's a there's a great um, Johan Hari is a journalist from the UK who did this pod uh, this um, TED, TED uh, talk, TED talk, right? Yeah, about everything you know about addiction is wrong, and he fr- he quite, he he framed it that way, right? And I think other people have used that framing as well. Like, but yeah, it's the connection piece that you know, and I think talking to families, right? Uh, you know, your podcast is so wonderful in terms of how it's. Um, engaging families uh, around this is that you know what we've been taught for many years is that as families you should you should cut off connection with your loved one because then they will hit rock bottom and they will realize and take responsibility for themselves and pull themselves up well actually we now know that's not true right and severing that connection and letting people hot, hit rock bottom for many 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 too many families has been death yeah um so you know, when families come to us and they go, if only we'd known about harm reduction, my son, you know, if we'd known about naloxone, the medication that you can use when people are using opioids, right? We might have been able to save our child, right? They might still 
five, you know. So, and, and I, when I talk to families, it's, I don't say it's not that you don't have boundaries, right? You might have boundaries as families about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, right? But you can maintain a connection even with those boundaries. And when people know that that connection's there and that people are rooting for them and that people love them, you know, um, that's, I think that's one of the, a very important factor that actually reduces people's risks, you know, because when people feel isolated, that's when their use can escalate. That's when their risk behaviors can escalate because it's like, well, what's the point? Why should I yeah. bother and get going to the syringe service program and getting sterile needles? Nobody cares about me. I'm not worthy. You know, I'm, you know, I just want to take this pain away. So the whole thing becomes just using the, substance to address and cope um so their ability to engage with kind of harm reduction um and you know maybe safer or managed use or or move towards not using becomes um it, it you know it becomes diminished because you know there's all this judgment and stigma that people experience because they're drug users. and yeah. families right there's stigma by association that families experience too oh definitely so I think that's also something that as societies, communities, we need to look at as a whole. Like, you know, when you stigmatize everybody that's involved, it just, it, it's not, it doesn't help the situation. No, it not makes at all. It worse. I've taken joy in several different times to our own uh, healthcare system. It's Kaiser Permanente. They helped zero. Uh, they would not talk to him unless he was willing to give up everything completely right then. Yeah. So he's like, mom, I can't do it. I can't luckily. I mean, not luckily, but like, I admire him for saying, you know what, mom, I can't say yes, that I'm willing to give this up completely right now. So he walked out several times and it was devastating. But God, if they could have said, hey, look, here's a, a, say, a harm reduction counselor. Let's go talk about how to be safer. Oh my God, that could have saved us a lot of pain and um, danger. And yeah. uh, though our healthcare system has a lot of learning to do, as we all do. <laughs> yes, and uh, I think you know it's but that's what people that's what people have been taught, right? Yeah, that's what they've been taught. And then what happens is, and I think we you know when I teach people about stigma, I talk about the fact that there's individual stigma, right? We stigmatize people individually as individuals in relation to their substance use. But then what happens is that individual stigma comes into, into organizations and into systems and becomes institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Have this, this thought pattern and this stigma that like you have to stop using any and all drugs, right, in order to access treatment, which is really... It's so counterproductive because then like Joey and many people, right, they walk out of those systems and, and when there's so much help they could be getting. In harm reduction, we try and look at the whole person, right? And we talk about this model that was created by Dr. Zimber um, called the drug set setting model, if people want to look that up. So what it does is you look at the drug itself. And often where we go to when we're trying to reduce risk and stop people, like, because, you know, again, it's all coming from a place of we don't want people to hurt themselves or people around them, right? We focus solely on the drug, right? And all mm. the in relation to the drug. But we also need to look at someone's set, which is who they are, what's going on for them, why they're using, what's this relation, you know, are they happy? Are they sad? Are they housed? Have they eaten today? All these things about someone's individual set, right, as a person. And then the setting that they're in, right? What kind of setting are you in? Are you, again, are you homeless or are you, are you, are you um, living with a group of people and using with a group of people or are you using alone, you know? Um, and also it's really important. Sometimes you might be moving someone from a house who's houseless into, an, into a house setting, but they lose the group that they were using with and so their risk factors change because now they're still using, but they're using alone. But what we say with the drug set setting model is we want to look at all those factors. So when, for example, when somebody acts as a healthcare system, we're going to have a conversation about with them about, well, what's your priorities right now? And their priorities might be, you know what? I want to address my mental health issues. I'm not ready to stop using yet because my use is meeting some kind of important need for me, right? Mm -hmm. Recently kind of talking to someone who, who's got a young person that's using weed for anxiety, right? So, and they're not quite ready to stop using yet because they're managed in some way it's meeting a need around their anxiety. 
that, but that, that doesn't mean that it's a better room. That the weed is coming with other side effects and other impacts. So, but that person wants to work on their mental health and what's causing their anxiety first, and then they can move towards changing their use, you know, versus saying, no, you need to stop using everything now. And then we can talk to you about your mental health. Yeah. Right. To me, is because they're at, maybe they're using because of the issues with the mental health. Right? Yes, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's a toxic way around doing things. So, yeah, you know, I would say to families out there, you know, if you've got a, a young person that's like in that predicament right now, yeah, it is. It's finding out like, yeah, where are the harm reduction programs out there? Because those harm reduction programs, they might not be connected to big systems like Kaiser, but they might be connected to other healthcare providers who are willing to embrace a harm reduction approach, right? And the research is in too, right? Um, there's now research that shows that people who access harm reduction, particularly student service programs, um, are five times more likely to go to treatment than people who um, who are using drugs that don't access syringe service or harm reduction programs. I think the research is particularly around syringe service programs, but I think it shows how that approach can really optimize the impact. Like I talk about, you know, what harm reduction does is it puts more tools in our toolkit, gives you more options to work with, not just some people some of the time, but more people more of the time, right? And also it just, it gets people into better shape. You work with them from a harm reduction perspective. You address that internalized stigma. You treat them as a whole human being. That, and then when they go to treatment, they feel better about themselves. So they're more likely to succeed. And that same research says that it's about five times more likely to go to treatment and around three times likely to sustain that treatment. Wow. Yeah, oh, that's, that's powerful. You those know, are so great and, statistics. Yeah. Wow. And it's easier for me because I've been in it a long time to see the impact it can have on people. Um, and I recognize that when this is new to people and it feels, it can fit, you know, I've been there, it can feel, oh my gosh, is this the right thing to do? And when it's a family member, that, that feeling is like that feeling of fear is even greater, right? Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, you know, I, I, so I recognize it's easy for me to here to sit here and say, this is <laughs> best practice, right? This is. <laughs> way to engage people but I also get why people can be fearful of it and so a lot of my work is helping people to feel that reassurance right and to understand and to tell the stories of like from my experience of how it has really helped people and get people alive you know that's the thing we want you know we want people to stay alive to have a chance of recovery right yeah I've always said I, I'm just trying to keep joy alive until he can figure out you know, what to do with his life, you know, how to, how to heal those wounds that he has, but he has to be alive in order to do that. Right. So that's what we're trying to do. He, he knows it too. He's trying, he knows exactly what will kill him. <laughs> you know, it, something might kill him that he's not expecting, you know, but that's always the danger, but he's, he's trying really hard to stay alive and just so he can continue to work on his his stuff that's causing him to want to use all the, all the substances. I mean, that's such, and I, I you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying there, Beth, about he knows. Mm -hmm. he knows. And that's the thing we want to, we want everyone to know. We want everyone to have the right, the education and the knowledge to keep themselves safe. I mean, it's kind of same as, you know, as, as, as parents, like there's all that, the safer sex education, right? And there was always that, just, oh, you know, if we teach them about safer sex, then they're going to go out there and have lots of sex, right? That's not, again, the research doesn't show that. It's not borne out. It's like, if we educate young people and give them all the information they need, right, to understand this, um, one, if they're, if they're someone that's currently using, and it's, it's actually going to give them the tools to stay alive. And if it's a young person that's not using, they're not. It's not going to suddenly switch them on to using, right? Yeah. It's just, it actually it's going to give them more information about maybe they why they don't want to use. But it means that if they do use or if they know someone is using, they've got they've got all the information at their fingertips or in their brain, right? To 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 be safer um, versus not knowing, right? Not not like let's not teach people about naloxone because that might mean that they'll go and use more. No, it means that they'll stay alive, right? So, you know, so, so it's just, to me, there's similar, there's similar parallels to like sex education, right? When we teach and keep people about that, then they can be safe for that. Similar with drugs, right? The more know and understand, you know, they then know, yeah, what's going to, what makes them sick, like, 
what what are, what, what increases their risks, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and what are the things they can do to reduce those risks? That's great. Uh, now, in your role at the National Harm Reduction Coalition, do you, you typically mostly does your work revolve around syringe exchanges and opiates, um, or yeah, is, that, it, is that most yeah, of it? Yeah, a lot of it. A lot of it does. Um, yeah, you know, because we've seen such an increase in overdose rates, and really sadly, in 2020, we think COVID had a real impact on people's <sighs> drug use. We saw like 93,000 people die of an overdose. <gasps> And that's, I mean, that's reported overdoses, right? And that's the highest figure we've ever seen. We were, you know, before COVID, we were seeing it plateau and begin to go down because there was so much work done in so many across communities across the USA to provide education, to provide access to naloxone, which is the medication that works on opioids um, um, to, you know, bring, you know, to reverse an overdose very effectively. Um, but Unfortunately, I think COVID, you know, threw a real spanner in the works of that work, of that progression. Mm. I, I mean, for lots of reasons, um, you know, I think people, uh, people were, you know, found themselves much more on their own, right, because of COVID. People are traumatized because of COVID, right? So that elevates if people were using, if they were using substances to manage things like, you know, trauma, depression, anxiety, it just exacerbates the also know in that you know we've got fentanyl uh, which is a very very strong opiate opiate has entered the opioid drug supply so there's um so people are kind of learning how to remanage their use with a much stronger product but in doing so people get caught right um so um that's where we've also seen a lot of programs begin to give out fentanyl strips which are urinalysis test strips that have been repurposed for people with drugs to test their own supply oh. so they can see if fentanyl is present doesn't tell you how much but at least gives you an indication um you know one of the other things we say to people assume assume it's present in everything anyway right like universal precautions just assume if you haven't got fentanyl strips that it is and you can still take the same precautions of using a little bit doing like using a little bit less going slow you know, testing a little product first so that you can see how strong it is. A really important message I want to say to people is, yes, my work is a lot around syringe service programs and injection drug use and opioids, but we also work around other substances, right, because people inject meth and fentanyl, right? Um, People inject other substances. But what we're seeing with fentanyl is we're seeing it showing up in a range of substances, and we're learning why. You know, there's different theories, like it's showing up in meth, it's showing up in other stimulants like cocaine. We saw a spate of people overdose in San Francisco who were using cocaine because fentanyl was present in it. And we're, again, we're not sure how, we're not sure if it's like accidental cross-contamination when people are using the same services to, when, you know, dealers are using the same services to mix drugs. Or, you know, we've even heard potential theories, and again, I don't know if it's true, People like from an altruistic point of view thinking, oh, I want to lessen the strength of this stimulant and I'll put some fat on that one. Oh, that's still a theory, but there's lots, we don't know why, but so that's the message we're giving to people and families is if people are using any kind of substances, be aware of this and have naloxone available. Don't assume, oh, my, my, you know, I only use stimulants. So the person I love only uses stimulants. I don't need to think about naloxone, have it just in case. Um, because if someone only uses stimulants, stimulants and they're very opioid naive, opioid naive, their body, if there's if suddenly they're strong on board, that puts them at a really high risk for overdose. And we've seen that happen. So wow. is, is naloxone the same as Narcan? Is that the same thing? It is. Oh, Great okay. question. Yes, it is. Narcan was the original brand name. And then when the patent like became, you know, some more so ran out and so more people could produce it. The generic name is naloxone. So yeah, so people move between the two, but it's the same product. It's a really safe medication. Um, you know, um, you can give if if you if you're with someone and you're not sure if they've overdosed, but they're unconscious, you can give it to them and it won't hurt them because it only works on the receptors in the brain where opioids sit. Because what's happening in an overdose is, um, and just to, oh, just to differentiate between op- opioids is the umbrella term for all those types of substances, 
And then you've got um, opiates, which are one's the kind of natural form, which is from the poppy, and one's the manufactured form. Um, but yeah, so naloxone is the medication that it, it kicks the, because what's happening is you've got too many opioids in the brain receptors that's telling the body's central nervous system to shut down and stop breathing. So that's what's happening when someone's overdosing from heroin or even like pills like Oxycontin, all of those opioid medications. Um, and so the, the net central nervous system is shutting down and people start breathing, so they're not getting oxygen. Um, so um, that's what's going on. So what naloxone does, it comes to those receptors in the brain and it kicks it off. The receptors and it sits there for about 90 minutes and allows the body to kind of wake up and recover and start breathing again so that's and so especially with fentanyl which is really strong that's why getting the loxone out there or narcan now where do people get it uh can you just walk up to a pharmacy and get uh, some of that it's it, it yeah in in many many states you can go to the pharmacy and ask for it in some states actually they've mandated that pharmacists give it to anyone who's receiving op- um, opioid medication um so you know oh. so like replacement and you've been prescribed percocet or oxycontin which happens regularly right they're now t- asking people to take naloxone kits just in case because people can accidentally take too much there right um so yeah so many pharmacists um have access to it especially the big chains if you go because they're, they're more national and you can go and ask for it and it depends where you are in the country many you can either get it for free or really low cost. I know in New York State, where I am, there's it's called NCAP. So you can go and ask for it and your insurance, you would pay no more than $40 maximum because there's a cap on what insurance providers in New York State can um, charge as a copay on insurance for it. But in many cases, you can get it free. There's also like many, you can go onto my organization's website, which is harmreduction.org. Um, if you go there, there's a naloxone finder. So you can go in and look like where are the naloxone programs um, near where I am. If you know where your local harm reduction or syringe service program is, they can have it there. There's also some health departments. So some, some CBOs and health departments that don't do syringe service programming still do overdose prevention. So they'll provide naloxone, but they might not provide the syringes. So you can often Google in your local area. Like I say, you can look up on our website, um, you know, where the nearest, um, you know, naloxone provider might be. You could call your local health department and ask them um, if they know, they should know, um, you know, your public health department. So, you know, there's a lot of coverage across the country. I, I've seen a huge explosion in the US in uh, an interest in harm reduction and student service programming and overdose prevention since around, I started working full-time doing this kind of work. I was working in direct service, running a syringe service program in New York before I came full-time into training and capacity building. So I'd say around 2014, because there was a big HIV outbreak in Austin, Indiana. Um, there's actually a book out by the doctor called The Canary in the Coal Mine that's just been released about the story of what happened. but small rural area of um, Indiana saw a big big as a result of syringe of injection drug use and there was no syringe service programming and we were involved in supporting folks in that region because it's very close to the state line with Kentucky as well and Louisville of developing syringe service programming in that region and from there I think this I call it like the domino effect like the states around that began like oh we'd they were experiencing very similar circumstances of like elevated hepatitis C rates, increased um, injection drug use. And, and on the back of that, there's always a risk of a HIV outbreak. They were like, oh, we don't want that to happen here. So people became more interested than ever in harm reduction. And so now we've seen a really big increase in access to syringe service programming and overdose prevention programs. That was the other thing that was going on is these really big rates of overdose, you know. So you see a lot of stories that came out of West Virginia as well, you know. Yeah, the, were called like the epicenter of what was going on at the time. Um, so there's been a lot of movement by people on the ground in very challenging circumstances too, like very conservative pushback. And we've even seen, you know, in California that's had where you are, Beth, right, that's had harm reduction for a long time in certain places, like some real significant pushback right now um, from very conservative groups that think it's the wrong thing to do, think it's enabling. So uh, 
like we've seen programs um, slapped with lawsuits. We've seen people close down. We've seen people have to go back underground when they were above. Oh, no. So it, it's something that as harm reductionists we can't be complacent about. Like we think we, we make so much progress and with people and then there's this pushback. Um, uh, two steps forward, one step back. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I also, I'm connecting it for me right now. It connects with a lot of the pushback around COVID and science related to that and, you know, COVID harm reduction, right? I, I mean, it's interesting how people have embraced harm reduction around COVID, right? When you think about wearing a mask, is it really? <laughs> That's a harm reduction tool. Oh. Um, you know, um, getting vaccinated. I mean, we talk a lot with our participants in student service programs about getting vaccinated for the flu and hepatitis A and B to keep them safer, you know. So there's not been a huge leap in harm reduction is so well set up to talk about COVID. And, and in many communities, actually, it was the harm reduction student service programs that kept going. Like they might have closed for a very small time in COVID to kind of reorientate themselves, but they're very used to dealing with crisis organizations. So I've heard people in some communities like, yeah, that's like so many more people started coming to our program because we were the only we were the only kind of social care program. Oh, wow. providing service, any kind of services, you know, because the thing about syringe service programs, that's what we that's why we call them syringe services, because they do so many services. It's not just syringes, right? They might be giving out food. They might be doing so case management. They might be helping people access housing, you know. So, um, yeah, they became in some communities these real hubs of support at a time when other agencies, you know, couldn't operate for whatever reason because of the COVID restrictions. Wow. That's a great, that's great that they're, they're there for the people. Man, uh, can you tell me anything about teens and opioids? It, it, I know it's really bad. Do you have any sort of statistics or an a take on is it getting worse is it getting better i'm not a great data person but what i can say is that we've definitely seen the age range of use of opioids drop so i would say when i first came to america in around 2008 we were at that point we were talking a lot about the aging population of heroin users and opioid users right it was a much older age range um, but then we began to see, I think, lots of changes that were going on in society and circumstances. You know, you think about the impact of the recession, you know, and what that was doing to people, um, you know. So um, and just also the proliferation of opioids, right? Pills. There's just so many more pills around, right? Um, for all kinds of reasons, um, you know. So I think just. Similar to what I've seen in, like, for me, the trajectory of, like, opioid availability, like, when it goes up and down, that's when you see a shift in who's using as well. So we've seen these patterns of much younger use because opioids is much more available, right? Teenagers could find OxyContin in the medicine cupboard at home yeah. because parents were being prescribed it for pain, right? Or some t some teenage athletes right, were being prescribed it in order, you know, to treat pain from injuries, um, and just like, so we saw this, the age, the age of people that were coming to our programs begin to get younger and younger. Yeah. So it's just, I think it's just the availability of that though, that means that teenagers and young people are much more exposed yeah. and it's more accessible than it used to be. So we've seen this. So that's where we've also seen on the back of that, this increase in injection drug use, because I think one of the things you were interested in talking about is like, you know, how do people, like, why do people move to injecting, right? Maybe people are taking it in pill form or smoking it, um, you know, and an injection drug use is a much more efficient delivery system. It means people can access the, the high or not feeling ill, right? Because that's the oh. other, you know, people are not just getting high, like ha there's, there's something around getting high, but there's also not wanting to feel withdrawal symptoms. So um, injection drug use, as people become more um, dependent on the substance, and so they're not getting the same reaction they were getting, you know, from when they first started using, it's like, okay, I need to use more, or this different delivery system through injection is actually much more efficient of getting the high that I need or removing the withdrawal that I don't want to feel, you know? Uh. So that's, you know, 
and, and not everybody not everybody moves on that trajectory towards injecting but many people do i've also known through my kind of working with folks some people that were introduced immediately to injection drug use because that was how everybody else was using around them you know mm-hmm. so you know so i you know but in terms of harm reduction ideally if people are going to take um, opioids or opiates, we want them to take them, not inject if they can help, if they can help it. So I remember back in England before I came out to the US, I was working with some younger users who were earlier on in their drug using career and, and journey and like helping them to kind of navigate, well, yeah, can I stay smoking this, right? Or snorting drugs instead of moving to injecting it. And the reason is because uh, the injection, you have the risk of infection. Yeah, there's so many more physical risks, right? Mm-hmm. So you're actually placing a puncture wound into your skin, right? And then that can get back, and, and then it's going into your veins. So that can introduce bacteria, which can cause bacterial infections like abscesses. It can even cause blood infections that can lead to conditions like endocarditis, right? Which is a really um serious um infection of the heart tissue and so that can actually permanently damage people's heart or kill them right and and, you know it can affect all kinds of like your kind of your systems of veins it you know it can cause problems so yeah it's just a much more i suppose invasive way of taking the drug even it's efficient but it's much more invasive there's more chances of like physical repercussions um does hepatitis c from the injection too it can be yeah so when we think about like yeah that you know the whole history of um syringe service program and what you're doing is you're giving people sterile equipment so that one they're not sharing with other people because that's where the transmission of hiv particular hepatitis c oh from the sharing yeah so when people are sharing their needles with each other which you know, and some people, again, it goes back to educating people. Some people don't know the risks because nobody's ever educated them on it. Or they might know, but people are so, like when you're in the draw, it's just such an awful, awful feeling. People just want to take that away. And they'll, they need to take they'll do away. anything, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, so that's another reason why when we, you know, when we do syringe service programming, we want to make sure people have got enough for themselves. And maybe I used to say, do you need a few extra? Because somebody might always want to borrow one of you. <laughs> but if you're giving that sterile syringe to someone else and you're not sharing that, you know. And also we teach people it's not just about sharing the syringe, it's any of your paraphernalia and equipment. Because if somebody has hepatitis C and say they, they their blood can contaminate the spoon, it's also called a cooker, which people, you know, they dissolve their drugs into to create the solution it can you know it can get on into the water that you're Mm -hmm. using to dissolve your powder like so it's that's why syringe service programs give all as much of the paraphernalia as possible um to people so that you know they can have their own set of equipment at all times um to prevent that and hepatitis is particularly transmissible it's a very um robust Um, virus that can live outside the body in very small amounts of blood for quite some time Mm -hmm. so by it once it's around it can be around and it's so it's more transmissible hiv yes but like it once it's outside the body hiv it can die off quite quickly Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's still always a risk when there's blood present so yeah though that's why yeah, the sterile syringes are real, and 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 also the other equipment and educating people is a really important tool to prevent in those transmission rates from going up any further. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, getting people to treatment. That's the other thing about the harm reduction programming, right? Is that in that connection, you know, if for example, somebody unfortunately has got HIV, right? We keep them connected. Not only do we give them sterile equipment so that they're not transmitting it to anybody else. We're getting them connected to their meds, right? Which if somebody's on their HIV meds um, and they're taking them regularly, they become what's called undetectable, which means that your viral load is so low that actually you remove the chance of transmitting it anyways. It's a similar concept to why there's a lot of education around access to PrEP, which is a medication that prevents sexual transmission of HIV. Because again, um, if someone's taking PrEP and they're 
they're having sex with someone who has HIV, but that that partner that they're having sex with is on the HIV meds, you've got extra protection on both sides because the person who's HIV positive, who's taking their HIV meds regular, is also undetectable. So, you know, so, so there's lots of again, that's a big harm reduction, um, you know, discussion in terms of sexual health as well. But yeah, so. Um, and, and then when that's HIV, and when it comes to hepatitis C, there's now cures. Like for many years, we couldn't say cure. We could say there's treatment that can get your hep C under control and can prevent further damage to your liver, right? It can prevent you progressing towards liver cancer and, you know, stage four hep C is like basically like liver cancer, right? Oh, um, wow. If, so for many, many years, we just had the treatments, which were pretty harsh and lots of side effects. But now, if somebody unfortunately does get hepatitis C, there are treatments available that cure people. So oh. another thing around harm reduction, harm reduction programming is we're you know we're engaging people if if they have you know unfortunately got hepatitis C or HIV or if say they've got an abscess right or you know we we can intervene to get them the treatment and care that they need regard and it should unfortunately similar to what you're saying with your healthcare experience there's still some providers that are like no you have to stop using before I'll give you your hep C treatment. Ugh. And it, it doesn't make sense because who's most at risk of transmitting hep C? Someone who's positive. Right. You cure them, right? But they're still using, but they're cured, then their chances of passing on hepatitis C removed. Right. And like we there's a lot of education to be done with medical providers around this stuff as well. But yeah. it's getting better. You know, we're seeing more and more people begin to again I I also talk about like there's a privilege of understand I've been privileged to be taught this and a lot of people haven't so a lot of the work that we do at Harm Reduction Coalition is is to give people that education right and I've seen people get that education and they're still sitting with the discomfort of it all but they sit with it for a while and then they're after a while they're like okay now I get it now I can see how it's working but if we never have a opportunity to give someone that education even if they're initially resistant to it there's never a chance that that seed will germinate and grow into this understanding of okay there's another way of doing this right you know there's a I mean overall what we're trying to do at Harm Reduction College is dismantle the war on drugs because that's Mm -hmm. you know that's where the most harm is done you know it's not it's not necessarily it's not Sometimes it's not the drug itself that's doing the most harm. It's the policies and the systems around it that are doing the most harm, right? It's the stigma. It's the criminalization. Yeah. Um, That is killing people because they're so scared to go forward to get help. They're so ashamed to ask for help. They're ashamed to maintain those connections that keep them alive because of the systems and policies that are in place. They can, but with the right education, they can very easily manage the drug itself. Mm-hmm. And like you say, like like you know know how to keep themselves alive, but it's the systems that put all this stigma and and that kind of pushes people away from from the safety, right? Yeah. From the harm reduction that they need to and, stay alive, to even have a chance of like working out what recovery looks like. Right, right, right. And procuring uh, drugs from underground sources is extremely risky. You have no idea what's in any of it. But that's what the war on drugs, it put everything underground. It, yes, absolutely. It created these underground markets, the substances, because it made them illegal, right? If you look at the history of drug use, right? In the late 1800s, early 1900s, heroin was prescribed. It was legal. <laughs> it was, I think it was being prescribed up until like the 30s, right? Until there was this big kind of moral panic on drugs, and some people decided to, you know, people in power decided which drugs were legal and which weren't. And as soon as things like heroin was made illegal, you then create this underground, un, um, what's the word, like unchecked, right, unchecked market. So, you, yeah, you don't know, unsupervised, right, you don't know what's in the substance. And that's where, like, the, the introduction of fentanyl yeah. has that's skyrocketed, skyrocketed our overdose rates. Yeah. But yet policies still persist. The policies of that are punitive, policies of prohibition, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't know as a 20, 
something year old community development work if somebody asked me about them when I first started do you think we should legalize all drugs I would have known the answer but today I'm like yes because it's the it's the illegality that's killing more people definitely places like Portugal that have decriminalized drugs and even the state of Oregon (laughs) right so that's you know we're going to see what happens there but Portugal nobody in Portugal wants to go back to uh, illegal drug um you know criminalizing people for using drugs because there's been such a benefit to their society and all the money that they used to spend on police is now being put into treatment and social services and helping people get back to work and helping people go back to like you know so society their society does not you know they this big experiment and that, and it's i think you know it, it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect, but it's way, way better than what it was when when drugs were criminalized. Definitely, know? I remember reading about Portugal years and years ago before uh, Joey got into using substances, and it really helped inform my reaction to him, mm-hmm. n- knowing that it's not the drugs themselves that's the problem. Really, it's why the hell are people needing to use them? What is going on inside of them? that is so painful that they're willing to go buy things underground and use unknown substances and to solve their problems. Can we figure out a better way to help them solve their problems? With the opiates and opioids, is it primarily for pain, like physical pain that people start to use them? Many years ago, somebody I worked with said that opiates are one of the best painkillers physically and emotionally. Oh, okay, both. Right? Uh-huh. So, the, yeah, for some people, yes, it's definitely around easing physical pain, right? Mm-hmm. It's important to remember we understand a lot more about how trauma and stress actually leads to physical pain, right? Yes. Uh-huh. So there's a real connection there too, right? So, so yes, you know, their chemical makeup addresses physical pain. And that's where we saw, you know, opioid, the pill version, right? And, and, and the proliferation of prescribing the pills was all around, we have this wonderful, magical substance to treat physical pain. And it is, it's a really effective drug. And it can, if it's administered in the right way, but I think what happened in the US in particular is it, it, it became this like, you know, magic wand for everything and everybody. And it wasn't, and even I've spoken to doctors that, are, you know, amazing harm reduction um, focused doctors who will tell you back in med school, they were taught like pain is the sixth sense and this is the way you can treat it. And it won't, it, it, it's not, it won't, you know, people won't form a dependence on it. There was a lot of, uh, even, this, even the doctors themselves weren't provided with accurate information to be able to prescribe it appropriately, right? Wow. So, so, you know, and so then what happened was when they learned this, they kind of shut all, you know, there's all this thing about pill mills and doctors that were over prescribing and people that, I mean, that's the other thing about America, health is healthcare business here, right? So there's mm-hmm. a financial incentive in the U, in the UK, it's different because it's in the national health service, it's universal healthcare. So doctors aren't incentivized in the same way, you know, around having to make a profit to maintain, like to, to you know, um, or it being a big, like healthcare system that's maintaining a profit rate um, to stay in existence. So it's a very different approach here in the US. I think that kind of drove that proliferation of prescribing. You know, it was seen as this real magical wonder drug. So it was prescribed a lot um, without realizing how, um, you know, people could become so dependent on it. But also like talking to, you know, a lot of what I've learned, my experience is listening to the people that I've worked with who will tell you that, you know, taking an opiate, whether it's heroin or a pill, you know, in terms of like emotional pain as well, it's like being wrapped in a big blanket. It, oh. it kind of, it creates this sense of like calm and, you know, ease in a way that not no other substance that anybody has ever taken can create, right? Um, so especially, you know, if you're someone who's using, who's struggling, you know, emotionally and physically, like it's like, it's, it, 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 it can be a really, it can meet so many important needs for you. Right. Um, and yes, it has side effects, but for many people, it, it's actually also a really important coping mechanism. I, I, you know, there's a story, um, a, a long time colleague of ours who was, uh, who got HIV in the early days. And was on the early HIV medications, um, was struggling so much with the side effects of the HIV meds back then, right? As a lot of 
they, they used heroin to counteract the side effects. It actually allowed function. It, you know, it, it, it gave them, it eased those symptoms, it gave them energy so that they could actually cope and work and function, right? And we yeah. I mean, opiates are used for things like Crohn's disease, right? So opiates are used to treat, you know, um, health, um, you know, people's health issues, uh, but it's just, it's the way that they're used, you know. Um, so we know a lot more now than we didn't know. Um, the world, it might look a bit like very different if we know what we knew now about how to prescribe them, right? And I think, there's, you know, that's some of the downsides globally. We hear, you know, because they're very important medications in, in like surgical circumstances, right? Or in trauma circumstances, they're really helpful medications. And so we're hearing from other countries that now because of America's clampdown on narcotics as you know what they define to be narcotic other countries have less access to pain meds than that they need for very legitimate purposes you know for people who need them for very important medical reasons so um you know so yeah it, it, it there's a lot to this whole topic um but i think the things i would say you know to the families and young people that are listening um, you know, is, yeah, really understand what opioids are or, or any substances, get to know them, even if you're going to, you, you know, if you're using them or you might be in a, a situation where you end up using them. I think it's important to have all the knowledge, all the harm reduction knowledge there is, and there's so much out there to access to keep you or the person that you care about safe. Um, I think the other thing that we talked about, um, we've talked about is how young people become labeled as addicts very early on when maybe their use is, is more at the, when we think about the continuum of use, there might be, it might be experimental drug use, right? It might be social drug use, right? Because they, because everyone else is trying this. I'm going to try it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it, curiosity, right? Oh yeah. Let me see how, you know, how this feels. Um, you know, and, but many young people become labelled as addicts and, and problematic substance uses very early on, which I actually think I have a very good colleague um, who's a psychotherapist who said that that can actually drive people towards the, the problematic end of the spectrum without recognising. Because most, most, most people that use drugs, they stop using, they'll age out, some, they'll age out of using um so like again if we come at it from a non-judgmental stance if we don't stigmatize and make people keep it a secret or you know make them feel crappy about themselves so that actually they use mm -hmm. take away the crappy feelings right if we come at it from a different perspective you're much more likely to keep someone at the less problematic end of the continuum of drug use than push them towards the problematic end um you know i, I think about it i mean my own experience my own son who, you know, was experimenting with um, with cannabis because, and it turned out we didn't know that he was dealing with a um, seasonal affective disorder. We didn't know that was, but it was affecting his mood. It was causing him to be stressed and anxious. So he was using, he doesn't mind me telling the story. <laughs> I've asked his permission. Um, but as a harm reductionist and a mother, I had to kind of stop myself for a moment when I found out what was going on. Cause like, you want to be mama bear and protect them, you know, and, and, and I had to kind of stop myself and have a conversation with myself. Okay, so how much just what would I do here? And we sat down and had a conversation and we did the drug set setting. We like weighed up the risk around the drug, but we also weighed up what was going on for him. Why, why is this, what's good about this? What's not so good about this? We also weighed up his setting and our setting was we were on a visa and we didn't have a green card yet. And like, if you get caught by the police, <laughs> have really big but you know all but that's a holistic way of looking at it right we talked about okay if you're going to smoke maybe don't smoke on a school night smoke on a weekend or smoke where are you smoking are you smoking in a like are you smoking in the park with your friends where the police can find you are you finding somewhere like i don't know someone's basement where you're all safe and out the way do you know what i mean there's like it's all those things up and it was a real lesson for me as a harm reductionist, but also as a parent about how to use my harm skills. Even though I was freaking out inside, I was like, oh, no, my God. you know, what's going to happen? Um, you know, and I talked to him about it now and he has a very kind of, you know, he, he has that kind of ability to assess risk, um, you know, and I teach our kids, you know, we, you can't keep your kids away. From, drugs are everywhere. Right. They're everywhere. 
the kid and the kids know where to get it. Right. And it was, so in Harmony, we talk, one of our principles is re- being realistic and pragmatic. So if we're realistic and pragmatic about it, if we're able to have those kind of conversations with our kids, then um, it's a bit like, you know, teaching kids to have big critical thinkers, right? To be independent. It's the same thing around substance use. If they can have those critical thinking skills, if they can understand the risks, then they can make they can make safer choices, right? But if we keep them protected from it and they don't get that education, then when they're faced with these situations, then they don't know what's the safest choice to do, to, to do, right? Or they don't know what, how to help a friend that's right. struggling. So, you know, I, I learned it kind of firsthand with my son who you know, ultimately banished his drug use and then decided to get counselling when we realised what was going on with his health, but, you okay. know. And kind of transitioned out of kind of away from problematic use, you know. That's so great. And I'm sure his, your experience with your son made you more empathetic to other people's drug use and um, their families' um, issues and things like that, since you had experienced it yourself. Yeah. And, and also getting the fear and of, a, of a parent, like you just, you don't want, you, you know, you feel that, you, you know, I don't know, as a, as a parent, we feel pe- their pain, right? We, we don't oh, yeah. want to experience this. We don't want them to experience harm or pain or negativity, whatever it is, right? Um, so we, some, but sometimes by shielding pit too much, kind of ultimately, if they don't have the information down the track when we're not around to shield them, <laughs> they, they mm-hmm. could risk. So it was understand, it was getting my kind of mind around that as a parent that really helped me to understand it. And like, he's known about naloxone since he was a young teenager. He's trained in how to use it. He talks to his friends about it, you know? Um, so again, like when he's come across friends that are struggling, he, you know, it's like each one to each one. So the more of us that understand and, and know this like education, what we can do, this approach, the more we can spread it through our communities and our society, and we, and in public health terms, they call it creating a culture of safety. So the more of us that are, get on the same page about this, the more cultural safety we can create for everyone. And so it's not just benefit. And that's the thing about Harris. It doesn't just benefit the person who's using drugs. It benefits everybody around them. Yeah. You know? So it's a really holistic approach. I'm so I'm so grateful that you were able to come on today and teach us all about harm reduction. I learned a lot today, and I thought I knew about harm reduction, but I'm now I know a lot more. How can we support your organization, National Harm Reduction Coalition? I mean, you can uh, you can go to the website and look at the resources, which is at harmreduction.org. I know you know what we offer. Um, if you're someone that works in public health um, or in medical care, um, you know, if you learn, you can then teach the folks around you. Um, I don't think you even need to work in that, but you know, if you, I think help us spread the word, right? Mm -hmm. I have this, it's like, I want harm reduction world domination. Like, (laughs) like, so come to our website, look at our resources. There's even training modules on there about harm reduction and overdose prevention that you can access for really low cost. Um, you know, if you feel like it's, you know, we, we're always accepting of donations because we're a nonprofit. Um, but I, you know, if you if you feel like we can help organizations that you work with in terms of resources or training and technical assistance, you can do that. We also have a policy and advocacy team that if people are working in a, like are organizing to advocate around this, which many people are, and we've seen many family members that have lost people that are like, I don't want this to happen to somebody else. How do I advocate? How do I talk to our legislators about changing the rules? Or if you're, you know, I think about where you are in California, North California, where we've had communities where we've had very, really nasty pushback from some groups. But what's helped is the groups of people that get harm reduction, like a third vision and impression who've been able to push back and go, no, this is why it's right for our community. So, you know, I think there's all different levels you can support financially, but I think just just supporting by spreading the word, right? Learning about harm reduction, you know, and it's easy for me to articulate it because I've done it for 30, you know, 25 years or I've learned about it 20 odd years ago, right? So when I way back when I didn't have all these words to talk about it. <laughs> you know, I have a lot more words to share now, but I think um, you know, yeah, I think that's how you can support our organization because we are trying to support people out there 
to widen and increase access to this kind of, of um, services and just approach and philosophy. Like it's not just a service, it's not just a healthcare or a public health service, it's a philosophy and a spirit, right? Right. One of our fa- one of the founders, um, you know, um, she talked about like loving people back to health, which I think is a really lovely way of like, that's what we're trying to do. We're loving people back to health, whatever that looks like, right? So I think the more people out there, if you're listening, the more you know about Hamlet and the more you can talk to other people and spread the word about it, the more we'll create that culture of safety for everyone. Um, makes our job easier, <laughs> you know? Um, when we come to communities that are trying to start these services, if the community's on board, if more families and communities understand it, it makes it much easier for us to help people to set up the programs that, that really ultimately get the services to people. Um, and then I think, yeah, just advocating to the right people to say, like, you know, we need to change the systems. We need to change those healthcare systems that you talked about, Beth, right, that didn't serve you. And I know it's happening. I've got a friend who used to run a student exchange that's now working in a big healthcare system in Kentucky and in Indiana, who's actually working alongside the nurses and doctors to help them understand how to integrate harm reduction practices. And that's huge because oh. systemic change, right? So that's the other thing. We want systemic change or changing the laws, removing these policies around the war. And one of the things I can say is that the Biden administration reached out to us even before they were in office. The transition team were asking us about this because they're recognizing the needs of people around drug user health. They they knew about this elevated overdose rates, the, you know, the impact that of, of people. And so hopefully we will begin to see policy change as well. That because it all goes into that culture of safety. Like, yes. We can all have the same attitude and, and belief in a, in a community, but then we're fighting the rules and the laws above us, right? That yes. Constrain our ability to kind of make this happen and make it better for everyone and safer for, you know, you know for families as well as the people who use drugs. Um, well, I'm definitely on board with you all. And uh, God, I hope it helps so many I know it is already helping people and um, to give every single person dignity, no matter what they're using, no matter what their past is, what they're, what they're into, what their pains are, everybody deserves dignity and uh, to feel worthy of, of getting whatever help they need. So, well, thank you so much, Emma. I'm so grateful for your time and for sharing with, um, with our audience and, I know Joey would say thank you as well. And he loves what you say about harm reduction. So he's totally on board too. So yes, I know we've talked. So yeah, I'm really glad that we were able to connect with you both. So thank you so much. If anyone would like to get in touch with the organization Emma Roberts works for, it's the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Their website is harmreduction.org. I encourage you to check that out. And while you're at it, uh, please share, rate, and review our podcast. You can find us also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and on Patreon if you're interested in helping support the podcast to maintain commercial-free episodes. Thanks, everybody, and stay safe.